So I'd love to present our speaker tonight. It's Brandon Ashton. He's an engineering manager at Weave. Uh, he is going to be talking about manual testing power moves using the browser. So I will go ahead and hand it off. Thank you so much for speaking tonight. Yeah, it's my pleasure. This is, um, can everybody hear me okay? Is this all right? Okay. Um, Sometimes I put the mic way too close to my face and you hear all the S's, so this is good. Um, this is my first rodeo, I'll have you know. So I, I work directly with Pax, uh, Pax Noyes, um, who is a big part of QA at the point. And she, she kept poking me and nudging me. It's like, hey, you should do this, you should do this. I'm like, but I freak out and I'm nervous. So, you know, she finally got me here. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> if it goes bad, it's Pax's fault. No, it's my fault. Um, all right, so let me go ahead and share here. Okay. All righty. Can people see the screen? Okay, we're all good. Let's go ahead and present. All right, so manual testing power moves using the browser's built in developer tools. So um, this is something that I'm kind of excited about. Um, I, I've used the developer tools a lot, the, uh, the browsers developer tools. And you might think, ah, developer tools, that's for developers, but it's for everybody. And you will learn, uh, you know, over the course of this presentation, you will learn a lot of cool things that you can do, including how to like hack stuff and cheat at online games. So, you know, that's coming up. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm, I'm Brendan Ashton. I'm a software engineering manager over test infrastructure at Weave. So I've been, I've been at, at Weave Communications working there for about a year and a half. Um, and we are growing like crazy now that, now that the market's going back up, you know, so feel free to connect with me. My, my LinkedIn is down here. Um, send me a DM on LinkedIn. You know, you'll have to mention, oh, hey, this is from QA at the point in your little message because I have a habit of ignoring those. But um, so send me a message on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with you. And we're definitely hiring. So let me know. Um, I was previously a test engineer for six years at BioFire Diagnostics, which is a medical device company. And, you know, they, they had a ratio of uh, test engineers to software engineers of two to one. There were, uh, or sorry, the other way around. There were one, uh, one test engineer to two develop, uh, software developers, and it was fantastic. There was so much work uh, being, uh, being put into testing and so much focus on testing. Come over to, um, and, and so I'm, I'm here at Weave building up an infrastructure. Uh, you know, our, our team is building up an infrastructure of some really cool tools to help people test the, the stuff at Weave. So I'm passionate about being on the bleeding edge of technology. I, I love it, the, the constant evolution, learning new tools, learning new tech. I'm, I'm a family man with a passion for road and mountain biking, as you'll see in a little bit. So that's about me. Um, now, what, so here's what you can expect. First off, we're going to talk about the anatomy of a web app and what the browser's role is in that. Um, then we're going to talk about the dev tools. We give you a little tour of the dev tools, how to open it, um, you know, where it is in the different browsers. Then we're going to get right on into the power moves, how you can change application state, how you can monitor performance, uh, you can read error output, you can change page sizes, you can throttle uh, network speeds, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, then if you are all still here and I haven't talked too long, then we'll have some time to do some bonus fun stuff just for fun, how to become a scammer um, and how to hack Google Meet and cheat on online gaming. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you will <laughs> learn from this meetup. So what is a web app? Um, and I told Pax that I'd mention her name and I'm mentioning it like for the fifth time now, but Pax, I've always loves a good analogy. So I tried really hard on this one. 
to describe what a web application is. Um, everybody's familiar with desktop applications and web applications, but what is the anatomy of it? So a web application is made out of several parts. It has HTML, it has CSS, it has assets like images, it has JavaScript, it has you know, backing databases, and it has backend code. It has all these things that are necessary for this web application to work. Um, and so how I've been able to describe it here, the analogy is a web app is like a house. So HTML is like the blueprint. It's the skeleton. It's like, there's a room here. There's a door here. There's, uh, they're laid out in this order. So that's a blueprint. So that's the HTML. Um, every single web page has HTML. And then CSS is like, what color are the walls? How big are the windows? Uh, how how wide do the doors swing open? You know, that's uh, that's the styling. That's the CSS. You can change the font size to bold. You can change the colors. You can do all that stuff with CSS. That's how you make it look nice. Then the assets are the furniture. They're the couches. They're the sinks. Um, and because I uh, and in a web application, this is like the like the images or the videos or the you know all these assets. These uh, the web application will download a font and be, so that it can use it to to render the page, or it will download an image so you can see an advertisement. Or you know those are assets. Then JavaScript is like the built-in features that come with the house. So like electricity, running water. These are uh, you know, the things that make a house work, uh, that provide the functionality of the house. Database are where you store some information like the cupboards and closets. Um, and then the backend code is everything that lives inside this house. It's you. And you are the most complicated piece of this. And you can perform a lot of actions. You can do a lot of things. You can throw a dance party. You can uh, shop online. You can do whatever uh, from your from your house, and that's all the backend code. So everything you can do, everything that is done, I should say, inside this web application, is handled by the backend code. So that's a, that's a little tour of a web app. So now now that we understand what a web app is. Uh, largely comprised of dev tools is like superman's x-ray goggles um it, it lets you see everything that's going on about the house it's like a it's almost like a real estate agent if you will that knows everything about a house knows every everything about the people inside of it can tell you what year the ac was installed all that kind of stuff that's that's what the dev tools does uh and the the so the the browser, the browser dev tools will enable you to look into these finite details. Oh, what are the network calls? Oh, what are the assets that are here? What's the HTML look like? How's it laid out? That's what the dev tools can do for you. So let's, um, let's see, let's go here and let me show you. Okay, so if we go, So let's take a very simple um, let's take a very simple application here. Uh, this is one that I'm just running running locally, but you can find this example everywhere else. It's like this simple to do app, right? It has these has these links. Oh, sorry, I should probably not show that yet. Um, it has this functionality. You you can add some to dos like present at a meetup not pass out you know all these things you can add to uh, your to-do list right super simple so let's dig into the let's give it get into the details so if we right click and we say view page source then this is the html um let's see i probably should make that a little bigger 
And it has, you know, information, double click to edit a to-do. We see that down here, uh, double click to edit a to-do. Um, then there's the title of the tab, React plus Alt. And here it is, React plus Alt to do MVC, right? So this is the HTML and that's the skeleton like I was talking to you about. Now you'll see a bunch of these scripts. These scripts are, uh, are the things, if you remember the JavaScript is the plumbing, the electricity, the functionality of the house. And so this application is loading in scripts like this base JS script or React with add-ons JS script. And that's like providing the plumbing for, uh, for the application. Then, um, but that's, that's a basic view. We can actually open up the inspector, the browser tools by right-clicking and saying inspect. And now we have, let's see, I think I can get yeah, good. Um, now we have a, a nicer version, a nicer layout of the same thing that we saw, right? We can, we can crack into this. So there's a, this is a paragraph element that says double click to edit it to do. And it's down here, double click to edit it to do. Um, but something else that we can see from here are these styles. Let's see. So styles. Um, these are the CSS. This is uh, how things how things look. So if I let's see, let's go over. Make this a little bit smaller. And if I inspect over here and go over here. All right. So I see that its color is currently this red. So I can actually change that. And now all these things are black, or I can change it back to red, right? So this is the this is the styling, and this is the first of the first of the panels that I wanted to talk about. This elements panel, and so elements panel shows you the HTML, which is the skeleton, and then the styles sub panel shows you the CSS. So for any any given thing. Here are all of the all of the things. Here I can change the font size to 48 pixels. I can change it to 20 pixels, right? The styles. Um, the next thing I want to show you is this console. Um, the console tab is very much like a terminal where you can uh, you can do can do commands on the on the terminal. You can say ls, cd, all that kind of stuff. You can do inside here. So this is the browser's console, the browser's terminal. So everything that the browser has access to, uh, you have access to within the terminal. And it also executes some rudimentary uh, JavaScript. I, I shouldn't say rudimentary. It actually executes all the all the JavaScript, like a fully featured JavaScript block. Um, and like I just defined a new variable called flaw and I can use it now. So this is, um, we won't get into this much, but this is where all the error messages come to, all the console logs, all the info, all, the, all that kind of stuff comes into here. Uh, the next thing I wanted to show is sources. So sources are the assets that I was talking about, the furniture. So this application has, um, let's see if I can make this a little bit small now. Um, so you see here's some JavaScript that they loaded in. These are, this is the plumbing. So these are how that works. Uh, here's the CSS. These are the files. Um, if we were on a different application, you would see some, pictures, like maybe I can go over here. Oh, by the way, I love mountain bikes. Um, so if we open this up and we go to console, oh no, we wanted to go to sources. Now we have scripts, we have uh, contents, images, this Jensen USA GIF. Um, anyway, so that's the, uh, that's the sources. Now we also have the network tab. 
Network tab is probably the best, the most valuable to manual testing. And it is something that is pretty critical to understand um, for us to really dive into um, uh, testing these things. Because what if, what if something breaks? We need to know how the application is working so that we can identify how um, how, how to test it, how to, how to break it. So you'll notice that when I load this page, um, let's see, you see all these things. Um, it is tracking all of the requests, all the network requests. So when I load this, uh, this application, the JavaScript, the plumbing is saying, hey, I need some pictures. I need some scripts. I need some JavaScript. I need, I need all these things. Um, and it sends all these requests. Like these are all, uh, um, like you see all these images. It, it downloaded, we keep you pedaling and 90 day returns and free shipping and trust pilot, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but importantly, um, it also has these XHR requests uh, that you can, these are filters by the way. So it has, XHR requests here, which are the ones that are hitting your backend code, the ones that you know when when the house interacts with the human inside of it. Um, and so, if I were to, wow, that's an expensive bike. Holy cow! Um, so, if I were to click on this one, it says a bunch of these XHR requests, um, which is informing Jensen USA, hey, this guy looks like he's interested in the Santa Cruz Mega Tower uh, CC. And it will, like it sent a request to get some extended offers. It's like, hey, this guy might be interested. So let's, let's get him some offers. And also let's update the page view count because uh, somebody visited this bike and so now the application code need, uh, knows because the front end application um, set this net network request. Um, and this is uh, some other requests like, hey, he touched here, he clicked here. Uh, this is the some more promos, a payment estimate, you know, all this kind of stuff. So this is the network tab. We'll get into this a little bit more, but what you need to understand is these XHR requests are the ones that can make or break your application. If you have a problem, if there's an error with one of these XHR requests, then that's bad news, like very bad news, um, because then your application isn't working correctly. Um, it means that you're like, in this case, if the extended offers uh, didn't work, then you would see an error in this console here um, and you would see in the network tab, you would say, oh, it looks like extended offers totally failed. And so we're not giving this guy the, the, promo, the promos and offers that we could. So anyway, that's the network tab. Performance tab, um, if I hit record and I perform an action on here, uh, let's see, let's select here and here. And then I then I just click on it, okay, uh, to view it higher at a higher resolution. Okay, so then I click stop, and what this will do, this is kind of fascinating and it's kind of overwhelming. Definitely is overwhelming, but it's pretty cool. So it will um, eventually. There it goes. Uh, this is a whole lot to look at. So just bear with me here. Um, but at the start of recording. 2000 milliseconds in or two seconds in, it looks like I hovered over, um, you see these tiny little, I'm so sorry, because this is like super duper duper tiny. Um, but you see these tiny little screenshots? These are actual screenshots of everything that was visible on the app as I was using it. And so it's a, it's a built-in way to record your actions, clicking, clicking through and it also has all this, all this gory detail for, um, for your front end developers about, um, let's see, let me make this a little bit smaller. 
about the about the frames that were loaded. Oh, look how many times this thing was repainted. Every time there's one of the gray lines, the whole app had to repaint itself. And uh, so that's good information. Interactions, um, there were some animations that were fired. You know, this is a whole bunch of good information. Looks like, uh, oh, there's our, sorry, my mic dies <laughs> if it doesn't hear anything. Um, there it looks like there's our extended offers and all these all these things happened and it and it keeps track of of the performance of these things. Um, another another thing. Let's see. Yeah, I guess we can just skip over that. But uh, here, this is probably terribly hard to see. But you see this blue here uh, that goes up and down and up and down and up and down. That's the actual memory that's being consumed by your application. So there's a whole lot of great information here if you want to dig into it. Um, and then let's go into application. And application is where this application is storing some information about the session, about the things I've clicked on, about the, the text that I've entered. If we go back into here, into this little to-do app, um, we, we have in this, local storage, this application local storage, it has record of all the things that I have entered. So read a book is over here and it has a status, it has a completed equals true. So this helps an application keep track of itself. Um, all right, so I think that's enough for that. And I think I need to move much faster. So I think I will. Let's move on to power moves. Um, Managing cash. How many times has it been the case for you? I know I've done this so many times. It's like I have, I report a bug. I say, hey, developer, I found a bug. And they're like, wait, all right, I'm going to go off and fix it. And they say, okay, it's fixed. You go text, test it again. And you hit refresh on your page, and it does exactly the same thing, even though they supposedly fixed it. They, they sent a new version and uh, you refreshed your page, you did all your same actions and you can reproduce it again. And that's, that's when it's like, eh, it doesn't work on my machine, but it works on their machine and it's a problem. The problem is likely cache. Cache is a way that your browsers have come up with um, to speed up page loading. So if it doesn't detect any changes in your application, then it's not going to reload everything. And it's going to pull it from a local cache, which which is like having it right on hand in your memory, and that makes it so much faster to load. So it's great for that, but not so great for testing. So check this out. Um, the browser tools in the browser tools. Once you open this up, uh, there's a couple of ways you can do this. Let's say your developer made some change to this to do application, and you should always clear the cache. Um, if they pushed a new change, or if they if they say, okay, there's it's it's up now, it's live now, we tested again. So you should always clear the cache. But if you have the developer tools open, you can actually right click on the reload button, and you can either do a normal reload, which will use the cache, or a hard reload, which will still use the cache, but it will, it will force it to go through all of its initialization, or you can do an empty cache and hard reload. So if you do an empty cache and hard reload, it will get rid of your, um, it, get rid of all your state. And then you for sure will be using the, uh, the latest application. So that one's a really key one. Uh, you can also come into here into the network tab and you can click disable cache. And let's see, that's the wrong one. Uh, you, can, you can click disable cache so that it won't store any cache and you won't have to remember, oh, did I delete the cache? Did I, am I for sure using the latest one? So that's a power move, number one. Power, power move number two, whoop, whoop, uh, pause app execution. So the browser is the one that's responsible for uh, instrumenting all of this and making all of this possible. And as such, it has the ability to completely pause, um, completely pause execution. So let's see. 
where did it go? It's over here. Let's see. Where's the last one? Come on, box button. Come on, where is it? Sources. There it is. Okay, it must have just been been hidden. But uh, what you can do is you can take uh, complete control over um, over your application. Let's see. It's going super slow to load this thing. Um, and you can have it pause at very key moments. So if you have pause on. You can just hit, uh, you can hit pause and it will totally pause your application. So at any point of the page loading, if, if let's say there's a, there's a pop-up that appears and, and disappears really quickly and it's hard to get a screenshot of, you can pause the application and then you can do whatever you want. You can also, um, you can also do things like um, breakpoints. So let's say that you want to break the application or pause the application every time it finds an XHR request. If you remember, that's that's when it's communicating with the backend code, the server. Um, and so you can get it to pause on a breakpoint, or sorry, pause on an XHR request. Uh, you can even specify that break when the URL contains I don't know, update page count or something like that, right? So you can get pretty specific about where you pause this thing. Um, then you can also, let's see something else you can do, global no event listeners. You can also do some cool stuff like, hey, let's pause when I click. And so I'm going to click on this. And so it's going to pause in the debugger. Or you can say, I want to pause when I reach a double click. So I double click on something. And it looks like double click isn't a registered action in this, um, in this app, but you get the idea. The next power move is reading the console errors. Okay, so this one's kind of a fun one. Um, kind of fun if you are a nerd like me. So. Uh, let's go to abcnews.go.com. And uh, you can, so there's, there's normally a whole lot of ads on ABC News. There's, there's a lot of uh, ads on every website, let's be honest, but ABC News has a lot of ads. And, and so let's say that you're the, the manual tester and you load this up and you're like, hold on. I know ABC News has a lot of ads, but they're not loading. What in the world is going on? And you say, developer, there's an error. I can't see any ads. So the developer will ask you to be pretty specific. Like it would be wonderful for your developer tester relationship if you were to say, hmm, I wonder if I can dig a little bit here and find out a little bit more information. So you come into the console tab and whoa, snap, there's a whole lot of errors here. Failed to load resource, blocked by client. Uh, I can't load this JS because it's blocked by client. I can't load this script or this Google tab manager, or this assets, like all these things are errory. What is going on? And so you, you could read through this and um, you can read through these things and think, huh, it has an error blocked by client Oh, you know what? The Brave web browser has an ad blocker built in. So I'm going to disable that. <laughs> it has, holy cow, it has a whole bunch of ads. I mean, a whole bunch of errors even still. And I, <laughs> I can't get ads to load. Anyway, uh, let's see. It might be a pie hole thing. Hold on, just bear with me for a minute. Uh, okay, ABC News, let's do one of these guys. We'll see if we can get some ads to pop up for us. Yep, nope, uh, but that's all right. So because you can see, uh, look, these are all XHR requests. This geolocation, this get request to geolocation totally failed. And so this is something that you could, um, you could take a screenshot 
and you could say, hey, developer, look, there was actually, um, these were the errors that I, that I observed. And the developers are going to love you there um, because your bug report is now going to include a, a better description of what actually went wrong instead of the symptom like that ah, can't see any ads. You can say, oh, looks like there was an error thrown by the tags.bkrtx.com get request and they're going to be much more grateful. So testing power move. There you go. Um, Modeling poor networks. Um, this one, this one, oh wow. Uh, this one is kind of fun too. So let's imagine that you are in charge of, let's go back to looking at beautiful mountain bikes, um, uh, testing this for uh, low end mobile devices. How in the world are you going to test? If you have this super powerful developer computer that has access to your company's gigabit internet, how are you going to test when you have a slow internet connection? So you can do that in here, actually. You can do that here. And I actually already had this throttling on slow 3G. So if it was a 3G network, like a mobile network, and it was slow, here's how long it takes to load. And that's painful. And so that's something that you can take back to your developers. You could say, hey, look, if I'm on a mobile app and I don't have super good internet, this is so painful to use because it's so slow. So it's right here in the network tab and you can disable, uh, you can say no throttling and wow, that goes so much faster. Or you can say, I want a slow 3G and then it takes forever. Um, or actually that used the cache. So it loaded a little bit faster. There's the cache. Uh, or you can even turn offline or you can add your custom like network speed. So you can, you can simulate devices. And on that same point, I'd like to talk about actually this one down here, this one, um, about devices. So in the same vein, um, you can hit this little button here, this device toolbar button, and check this out. You can look, uh, you can set this. I don't know if you guys can see that. Oh, sorry. Um, you can set it to commonly known phones or tablets. So you can say, oh, I want to test on a Surface Pro 7, which has, so you don't have to memorize the, the display ratio. It has a 9, 12 by 13, 68 of all things display ratio. So this is how it would look on a Surface Pro 7 or a Pixel 5. Uh, and this is how it would look in landscape mode. And this is how it would look in portrait mode. Oh, that actually looks kind of terrible. So this is, you know, good information, right? It, because you can talk about, talk about this to your developers. You can say, when I shrink down the size and we're viewing this on mobile, our website on mobile, then it actually looks terrible on the Pixel 5, but it looks great on uh, iPhone 12. No, it looks just poor everywhere unless you get a tablet. So that's good information. Um, let's see, let's go to the next one, check for leaks. I'm going to skip over this one pretty much. Um, basically, it's that performance that I showed you. Um, and you can uh, you can see this this memory here, and so what a memory leak is. I I kind of hinted at this with the balloon here. It's like memory is something that your application consumes or or, or uses, and your computer has a finite amount of memory on offer, and so the more memory that your application is using, the slower the client's device is going to be. And you can get it so big, like you keep inflating this memory, like injecting all of your application's memory into your computer's memory that you can pop the balloon and you can totally crash the browser. So this is something that's really good. Like you, so you would click around, um, you would click around the app with the recorder on and you can see that, oh, the memory goes up, up, up. Oh, but then it drops. Oh, good. Because they cleared that out, goes up, 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 and then it drops again. So 
this is a this is a good web page because it actively manages the memory. Uh, let's see, track performance. We already talked about that. Uh, managed application storage. This um, I talked about this a little bit already. Um, but application storage. If we come here, so we see that we have. Um, all of these, all these to-do items. And if I refresh the page, if I do an empty cache and hard reload, it stays here. Why? Because it's in the application storage inside the browser. The browser is actually storing that for you in its memory. Um, and so what we can do, um, let's say that we want to get back to a clean state. So I'm going to copy that and I'm going to delete this. And then I'm going to reload and voila, we have a clean state. And I didn't have to clear all of those. I didn't have to click the little X on all of them to get back to the state. And by the same token, I can just plug it back in. Like I could save it to, um, I could save it to here, and like a like a code editor. And then I can say, oh, yep, I read a book. Uh, I did not ride a bike, but I did ride a scooter today. And you can essentially um control the application state super easy and so you load an app for the first time and this will allow you to quickly and easily get it back to the exact state that you were before this really helps if there's a long involved process to get to this one specific bug spot and they say that they that they fixed it and you should test it again and so you can just plug this back in. Uh, you can restore the application storage state and then get quickly back to where you were, uh, to where you were testing. So power move. Um, then the last power move before we get into our bonus section is this lighthouse. And this one is pretty advanced. So um, I, I don't understand half of what this is saying, but um, this, is a built-in tool for Chrome only that will gather information. Lighthouse is a built-in tool into the developer tools for Chrome that will gather information and audit your website. And it will tell, um, yeah, now it's generating your report. And you can see that you got a score of 44% on performance. Accessibility looked pretty good. Best practice is pretty good. SEO optimization looked pretty good. Um, and it says, oh, it took 3.5 seconds to get to, uh, for the first time for the, the web page to look meaningful. Um, but it took 11.6 seconds to actually be interactable, which is quite long in, in today's standards. And so you can send this over to your developers and they can decide how, uh, you know, what to, what to do with this. So that's Lighthouse. Pretty cool. Um, Oh, accessibility, like this will provide some automated testing for accessibility. Like when a button doesn't have an accessible name, screen readers announce it as button, making it unusable for users who rely on screen readers. So that's good to know for accessibility testing and it's totally built in. Um, okay, well, that, was, that wraps that. Um, so we can crack into this bonus section that I've been excited for this whole time. Um, so I don't know if anybody has watched the YouTube videos about like scammer payback or whatever, but, um, I have, and it's crazy because the scammers actually use the developer tools behind the scenes to scam you or to scam the people that don't know better, but you will not be scammed because now, you know, because you're at this meetup. So what they do is they ask. Um, they ask an unsuspecting victim to log into their bank account. You know, this should be sending red flags for any security savvy person, but they're vulnerable types. Um, and they grant them remote access to, they get them to grant them remote access. And what the hackers will do is they will go in and they will inspect these elements. And they, what they'll do is they will inflate this number while the person isn't looking. They'll change this to say, oh, 
oh no, I actually sent you, I actually sent you $8,000. Oh no, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I, I made a total mistake, but you see you have $8,000 in your account. Oh no, you need to send this back to me. And so they will convince a person to, uh, you know, they'll be so convinced that, oh, look at that. I have $8,000 in my account. Therefore, I owe this scammer $8,000. If I'm a nice person, I will send them $8,000. So that's literally, there we go on the headphones again. That's literally what they do. They, they inflate it using the developer tools. They change this number, which changes the rendering. And then they give a story based off that. It's, it's crazy. But developer tools, there you go. So want to scam people into sending your money? Now you know. Uh, the next part is a pretty fun one. Uh, if we go to meet.google.com, and I start up a new meeting. Let's do, let's mute and let's turn off the video. Actually, we can do the video, okay. Um, and I, uh, something you can do in Google Meet is you can change, oh, no, that's not it. You can change the visual effects. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, I forgot to do this before, but um, it needs. It looks like I need to turn on hardware acceleration, which would totally kick me out of Google Chrome. So I can't do that. Uh, but what you can do is it enables, uh, like, let me see, add others. If I inspect here. Anyway, uh, what I was going to say is, um, if you uh, you can use the developer tools to hack what Google allows you to put as your virtual background. And you can actually put a video of somebody, like a custom video that you recorded yourself, like an MP4 video, and have it playing instead of you. And so, you know, you would cover up your, your camera, and then your virtual background would be playing this recording of somebody talking or somebody paying attention. And so you could just walk away from your computer and it would look like you're totally paying attention. Or you could play a prank on somebody and say, you know, record, record Pax while she's talking and then turn her video on, um, on for your video. And then it just makes everybody confused because you can record her talking. And so when you go like this, the virtual background would have her talking and then it screws everybody up. It's like, wait, is Pax talking? But that's Brendan's screen. So you can do that if you have hardware acceleration enabled uh, in Google Meet. Uh, then the last one that I'll do, let's kill this tab. Kill this tab and that one and I'll finish one, I'll finish one. Okay, let's go to Detective Possum. So this is an online game and it is by no means secure because it's super easy to hack and you'll see. Um, let me share, let's see if I can share a different screen. Hold on a sec. Okay. All right, can uh, can people see this one okay? Okay. All right, so I don't know if this is coming through, but uh, this is a little game and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little game from, I think it's Paw Patrol or something. And this evil cat is taking over your computer. Oh no, and the city. Don't try to stop me, but they give you a chance to stop them. So they say level one of 10, guess the password. Oh no, I don't know. There's five words or five letters. Let's do ASDFG. Nope, that's not it. But there's a clue here. Uh, first one is what you'll get when you fail an exam. All right, so the first one is F. 
second one is smiling the most, third one doesn't. So anyway, it gives you clues, right? And if you, uh, oops, if you go through all of these, you can kind of brute force your way through this. Anyway, uh, so if you get it, let's see, fourth one is me. So that's you, Ukus. Okay, oh, you got it, level two, you have another password. Okay, so this is kind of a, it's a fun little silly game. But what's cool is that if you have your power moves, you can totally hack this thing. Let me show you. So first we are going to look into this script. So if we look into the script, which is like the plumbing of the application, um, we can we can see a whole bunch of things. It looks like the rains index was zero. Uh, the te auto text time was 30, 60. Oh, there's a password time limit. So I can maybe increase the time right here. Hmm, interesting. Volume is set to 0.5. And uh, this is this is just talking about the talking about the application. So when I was, um, I copied and pasted this into here. Nope, it's in. Where is it? Okay, but here it is, and I can say music. Uh, let me find what I was looking for. Okay, so it's telling Unicorn, hey, Unicorn, play the music sound. So I can do the same thing within the console. I can say, hey, Unicorn, play the sound, but let's let's crank down the volume because this is quite this is quite loud. So I'm gonna hit enter there, and then it turns down the volume. Or I can because this is just JavaScript, I can turn it. Well, that was too loud. Hold on. I can't hear anything. Hold on. Ah. All right. Um, something else. So we can think, oh, well, how can I cheat this thing? Um, if I go here, watch this. I found this. And this is this is all inside uh, all inside this script over here, uh, elements inside this script. I just copied and pasted the script over here into a code editor so I could read it a little better. But this is all visible in the in the Chrome developer tools. Uh, so if I do word, check word. So I found this little gem here. Uh, and this is a function that says, oh, okay, check, check the word. And if the selected word is the same as the typed word, then you found the answer and you you did it correctly so what we can do is using the console we can actually check what the selected word is to tell us exactly what to type so let's go do that and we say oh no didn't want that one i say select selected selected word it looks like it is a n a s so I will type in A N A S. Hey, I got it! Woohoo! That was so easy because I cheated, and I can do it again. Now the selected word according to the JavaScript is burro. So we'll do burro. Got it right. Um, you can also do. You can also just hit this function. You can also just call this function because if it's correct then it just calls the set solved function and i can do that here so i'll just call set solved hit that oh i got it right without doing anything because i just hit the function guess the password i'll do it again and there we go so you can totally hack online games if you just poke around in these developer tools it's it's pretty fun so I, I definitely went over time and I apologize about that. Um, but that, that is me. So let's see, stop share. Okay, now I can see everybody else.
Okay. Well, do you have questions for the last uh, the last five minutes? Well, thank you so much, Brendan. This was awesome. I'm yeah. probably gonna watch the recording um, once we get it up on YouTube. So, because there was just so much information. So I'm really excited. Thank you so much for giving us that awesome presentation and talking. Yeah, happy to share. And thank you, Pax. It was a good idea. It was a good hey, idea. Pax. I know it was. Hey. <laughs> Old star. I was begrudging, but um, yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me, everybody. I I enjoyed my time.